I'm actually going to try and stay put this time because the last time when I spoke at this conference, they gave me a hand microphone and I kept walking over there so they had to adjust the spotlight. And then I would walk back here and they had to adjust it again. And I did that a couple of times. And then in the middle of the time they were like, in the middle of the talk, they were like, she's not gonna stop, is she? And then they just switched on the stage lights. <laughs> and I had no idea what was happening. I was like, so I'm just gonna try and stay here. <laughs> All right, so as you might have guessed, uh, I'm Laura. I, um, I'm a software engineer. I work for a company in Tokyo right now. We mostly put iBeacons into vending machines and then do a lot of cool stuff with them. And some more things, but you can ask me about that later if you want to. And I'm going to talk about writing better errors today. What I'm not going to talk a bit about is how to craft the perfect error message. Because I feel like there's already a lot of literature and like talks and stuff about that out there. But what I've always been missing is like kind of that step before, like to figure out like what do you actually want to say and to whom. So I want to take a step back and talk about the high level perspective, more about the approach, how do we communicate errors. I recently got a Roomba from a friend who is moving away from Tokyo. And um, I know if you don't know what it is, it's kind of like a tiny little vacuum cleaning robot which goes around on your floors and cleans them. So I got it and I brought it home and then I wanted it to clean my floors, so I put it on my floor. And I pushed a big clean button and I expected it to clean, but it refused. Instead, it started blinking at me. And I was like, I'm not quite sure what it's trying to tell me. And because I'm a highly sophisticated engineer, I decided to approach this issue with a time-tested and proven best practice method. I pushed a random button to see what it does. Test. <laughs> Sorry. And it uh, maybe we use a lapel mic instead. No, it's okay. Because it's, it's oh, kind of it's kind of uh, far from the. You prefer to stand there. You want me to be closer to the microphone? Yeah, that'd be good. Okay, I can do that. Okay. <laughs> right. So I pushed this button, and it started speaking to me in Japanese. <laughs> so I was like, I can like I can speak some Japanese. It's not that great. I was like, oh. <laughs> <laughs> and I pushed the button a couple more times and I finally figured out it was kind of trying to say something about error 2 so I deployed another time tested method which is googling the error message <laughs> and this is what I got error 2 open Roomba's extractor frame and clean extractors and eventually I figured out what it actually wanted me to do is to clean the brushes and so this is like most people nowadays don't really interact with robots every day yet. But what a lot of people do interact with a lot is software on a daily basis. And you kind of get the same stuff there, right? Yeah. <laughs> it's like you see this or like, okay. And it's not really that helpful, right? And we're like, oh, that's all like desktop software, like, you know, oh, those Photoshop people, or let's not even talk about Windows, you know? But we kind of do the same thing to the people that use our stuff. And it's like, that's not <laughs> helpful. <laughs> like, even more Railsy stuff, you know? This is not the resource you're looking for. I didn't even know I was looking for a resource, but thanks. What do you do with this, right? And so I was starting to think, like, what's the problem? Like, aside from the fact that these error messages are clearly not helpful at all, like, why aren't they? And I think the problem with these messages is that they tell you what's the problem. And I was like, isn't that what you want to know? Like, there's a, there is an error and you kind of want to know what's the problem, right? I was like, is that really what you want to know? And I started thinking some more about this because I was like, huh, I am frequently on the receiving side of these error messages, 
but since I'm a developer, I'm probably also somebody who causes other people to face these error messages. I was like, maybe there should be something done about it. So I was kind of trying to take a step back and was like, if there's an error, like, what is this error? And what am I trying to, what am I trying to say about this error? And who the hell am I even talking to? And so I figured, and I was like, okay, who am I talking to? Whenever I have an error, there are probably some different audiences. What could these audiences be that would be interested in this error that just happened? So first of all, we have the developer. Like we have a product, we have an app or something. There's a person on the back end, assuming we have a server client architecture, there's a person on the back end that writes this stuff. And their job is to figure out how to fix errors that shouldn't happen. Who else do we have? We have people that use our stuff. If we have an API, our product is an API or has an API, we have an API user and what they need to do is to figure out how to correctly call the endpoints that we provide to them and get the response that they expect. And last but not least, we have this guy. If our thing is, our product is an app, a web app or a mobile app or something, we have the person that actually needs to figure out how to use this app and how to do the things that we promise them they can do with our product. So now we have our audiences, they are the users and the developers, different types of users, the developer who writes the thing. Now we have errors. And for this one, I'm going to really generalize a lot, but I feel like it's helpful categories. We have user errors. I call them user errors. These are errors that are actually caused by the user by inputting things that aren't correct. And these errors are expected. They have rules. So we know like there's images and you should only upload images up to like up to this size. Or you have to input something can't be longer than this, stuff like that. You're not supposed to use a credit card that's expired. So it's not necessarily the user's fault, but they cause it. And if they know the rules, and they follow the rules, I, maybe that's a little German in me, I'm like just like, oh, just follow the rules and everything's gonna be okay. <laughs> but, um, so if you follow the rules, then the error goes away. And then we have this other type of error, which I'm gonna call the server error for now. It's stuff that's hap that happens like in your code, in the backend, and it's unexpected. It has no rules, like there's nobody that, like no error message that you can possibly write for a bug that tells you right away like, oh, here's what it is and this is how you fix it. it would be great, but unfortunately, it doesn't usually happen. So you actually need to go and investigate if something like this happens before you can fix it. So our two types of errors are the user errors and server errors, and now we can chart this up. We have users, we have developers, we have user errors and server errors. And now we can think like, who actually cares about all of this stuff? Like who sees what and who's like, oh, this is my thing, like I gotta deal with this. If I have a user that faces a user error, that's something they can fix. They just need to input the right thing. They need to know what they should input and then do it. A developer, that writes this code, like at the point when the user actually inputs something, you can't really stop them. Like there's nothing you can do about it. You can try to make it clear and everything, but if they do something wrong, you can't stop them. So you kind of can't really fix this. On the other hand, if you have a server error, a user can't really do anything about it. They can't go into your code and kind of try to fix the bug and you don't really want to anyways. You can and you must, however, fix your server error is like if there's a bug, you have to go and find it and fix it. So what you really care about as a user is the user errors. These are the ones that you have to handle or deal with. And as a developer, you mostly want to know about the server errors. And as we already figured out, server errors have bugs mostly. You have to know what's the problem because you have to figure out on your own like what's wrong, you have to have all the information that you can get 
to debug. However, as a user of an app, I have exactly zero interest in debugging this app that I'm using right now, or this API that I'm using right now. I just want to use it. Hmm. Here we go. So I don't really want to know what's the problem. That's just a step on the way. What I really want to know is how do I make this problem go away? And now if we look at this kind of error message, guess who wrote this? The person who wrote this is a person that is used to dealing with errors on their side, where they don't really have a solution of how to make it go away. They just want to know what's the problem. And that's what they tell the other person as well. For them, however, it's not actually what they want to know. So if we keep that in mind and look at it more on a, I guess, like a system level or a flow level, this is my extremely creative uh, flow diagram. <laughs> 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 when we have a request coming in from some kind of interface, like no matter is it like an API or like an app or whatever, an error happens here, what do we do? If this is an error that is actually interesting for me, the developer, I gotta log it. Like, I gotta be informed about this error. I gotta know what happened. So this is basically logging. And you wanna put everything there that tells this person what is the problem. On the other hand, I also gotta communicate it back to the interface. And here I really don't wanna know what's the problem. I wanna know how do I make it go away? Can I make it go away? So we're splitting this up. We're deciding what is this, what kind of error is this, and who am I talking to about this error? And now that we know that, we can kind of think about a bit more how do we communicate this, because now we know what we want to say and to whom. So. What about user errors as a developer? Is that something that interests me at all? Most of the time, I'm kind of like, I don't really care. However, this is something where, that I've actually experienced um, on products that I've worked on. If, there, if you constantly get input about users not being able to do a thing, or they always make errors, they do the wrong thing, you can kind of turn on to selectively log input errors, like this kind of errors on an info level, to see how often they happen and at which point they happen. And if you're like, oh, like every second person like trying to do this gets it wrong, then I have to rethink my interface. Then you go and talk to the UX people or whoever made this thing to figure out how can we actually not make this happen so much. Because we have to communicate the rules to the user, but in this case, me as a developer, I actually want to know how to not make it happen. As a user, on the other hand, I'm concerned at this point, like, how do I make it work? So what do I want? As an app user, first of all, I want really clear and readable error layouts. I don't want to kind of try and have to kind of look around and see what it actually is. I want to see it right away and when it's super clear. I want it localized if possible. If I have no way to tell what kind of language this user speaks, I have to make a reasonable assumption about a default. Can be English depending on the country. If you're in a country where you can't assume everybody speaks English really well, you have to then do something else. For example, in Japan, it's usually not a reasonable assumption to make English error messages. You probably want Japanese. And you really want to provide a clear course of action to solve the problem, no matter what it is. You tell them, like, you uploaded something that is too big. Upload something that is maximum one megabyte. Or, like, your credit card is expired. Use a credit card that is not expired. Use a coupon that hasn't been used yet, whatever it is. Tell them what to do. 
And that kind of ties in with the other one, like if you want to minimize these errors from happening in the first place. The best error is the error that never shows up, that never happens. So you want a lot of front end validations for stuff that you can validate in the front end and you want good UX for people to understand what they actually are supposed to do. If we have API users, the thing about them is they usually are developers also. They just kind of can't look into your source code. They have to talk to you through this API interface. So they kind of understand, like you don't have to guide them along that much because they're used to debugging also. But you want to make it super easy for them to know what went wrong and how they can make it right. So use matching HTTP status codes. There's actually, so there's a service that I have had to use at work and they have an API and this API has an endpoint like an endpoint one and uh, to tell this endpoint what to do is you put into the body of your request an ID that says for example I want to do like register something you put ID 022 and like all the other parameters and then you send it and this endpoint will always return 200 okay <laughs> no matter what happens and then in the body of the response you will have an error code if there was a, there was a, there is a result which is zero if everything was all right one if there was an error then you have an error code which tells you what kind of error it was and then you have a detail error code which tells you what kind of detail error it was and then you have to go and look at a gigantic list of custom error codes to figure out what went wrong um, a person on Twitter, like I shared this on Twitter and a person came up with the app description of this as 200 okay but. <laughs> <laughs> so you can like, I mean, as it says in the second point, like put in specific error messages, put all the custom codes you want but still like make, re like use reasonable HTTP status codes. Like there's a reason why there are, why there are um, standards for this, right? And include everything into this response that makes it clear what to do. Like you say like parameter something is, if you just say parameter missing, that's not helpful. Parameter blah is missing or validation failed because here is what, like how to make a value, uh, valid request. Also kind of like the front end validations on the app user side and the good UX, write really clear, clear documentation because API users do occasionally read the manual. So give them one. It's going to be a lot less trouble for you afterwards. And that's the API user. What about server errors? As a developer, this is something I care about a lot because I need to fix them. So you want to make sure that your code has robust error handling. Like if there is a bug or an unexpected error, you want to kind of minimize the damage. You don't want everything to crash and burn. You want to log it and report it, like you use like air break or roll bar or whatever. And include as much information as possible. Like most of these services, like they give you a gem or something that you can include and they already pull out a lot of info. Like they give you the backtrace, they give you the actual error they give you the um, parameters and everything, but whatever else you have and you think might help you actually reconstruct this error and um, be able to redo it and find what is the actual issue, put it all in. Like send it to your logging service. Do make sure that someone actually gets notified because you can have all the logging in the world and all the error reporting in the world. If nobody ever looks at it, it's kind of pointless. So what we do, for example, we have our, like we integrate our roll bar with one of our Slack channels. So whenever there's an error that happens for the first time, that happens repeatedly, we get notifications on Slack if it's a production system. So all the developers are in that one and then you can actually go right away and look at it and evaluate. Is it something that you can have to fix right now? something that you can fix later. And if you want to, if there was an actual bug that affected users, you can then 
announce publicly on a changelog, for example, that it was fixed, so people know, hey, it's not going to happen again. What about users and server errors? It does impact them, right? I mean, they really don't want to know what went wrong because they can do nothing about it. They do want to know kind of what's going on, especially tell them that it's not their fault. Because if something goes wrong and you don't know the system behind it, and you're especially if you're not a developer and you can't guess, and you're maybe not even very comfortable with software, you're going to be really scared. You're going to like, oh, what happened? Like, did I break it? Like, did I break the internet? Did I break something? And so you got to tell them, hey, this is what happened. It's our fault. This is what to do next. And it can be, for example, just try again later. We're like over capacity. We can't serve you right now. Like, just try again later. Or, hey, this is an actual problem with your stuff. Please contact support. I found this little cartoon, and I thought that's quite descriptive because, like, this kind of stuff is scary to users. So if you just say, "Whoa, error, bam," they're like, "What am I going to do now? What am I going to do now? Did it delete my data? Did it charge my credit card? Did it charge it like five times? Can I order again? Like, what do I do?" Or you just tell them, "Hey, something went wrong on our side. You're safe. Just try again later." And they're going to be like, "Phew, okay, I'm good." Just going to try again later. So instead, for example, of sending something like this, which is still scary, and I'm like, to a developer, it makes sense because yeah, this is you know this is what happened. To a person who doesn't know, it doesn't make any sense at all. It's just scary stuff. You did something wrong. Instead, you do something like that. And you don't even have to go all artsy, like if you don't have somebody to draw you like flying whales. You know, it's OK. Like you can just write the message, like even if it's not nicely styled. Just say it. It's going to do like, like I'm a firm believer in the 80-20 rule. Like, you know, 20% you, of effort brings you like 80% of the way. So if you just say it, no matter how, it's already going to be much, much better. And this is pretty much what we want, right? For everybody who is interested, everybody in our audience, we want to achieve or we want to enable them to solve the problem that they're facing in the best way possible, in the fastest way possible, and with the minimum of frustration, no matter if it's a developer, if it's a user, or anything. And now that we know what we want to say about what kind of error to who, we can now go out and figure out how to write the perfect error message, how to word things, how to display things. But this step about like, what am I going to communicate to who? That's like that's been like the missing link for me of like going from an error happens to like what kind of thing do I put into my error message? And this is pretty much what I wanted to share with you. So I hope this is helpful to you when you handle your errors in the future and communicate them to whoever is interested in them. Thank you. Awesome stuff. Thanks, Laura. I think it's a great message. You think about the people who are going to see your errors and give them some direction of what to do next. Can we get some questions, please? If anyone has them. Yes. Great. Hi. Thank you for the talk. Um, what do you think is the major problem with, like, because you showed the 500 in Rails error message? And um, I mean, I've seen it a million times. Mm -hmm. And I think, oh, well, what, what do you think is the the reason for that, because if I can make a comment, I think most people don't know how to kind of, or I mean, I wouldn't know how to um, keep, like, to, how to track what error happened, because, you know, you have this 500 generic handler in Rails, and then once this exception is happening, you basically lose information of, okay, was it, I don't know, the wrong credit number, uh, credit card number, or was it, I don't know, uh, um, Redis uh, connection broke or something like that. So I think. Oh, I'm, I'm asking, how would people track what actually happened, especially in Rails? 
um, track is for like the developer, like what error happened, or track for the person who sees it on the front end? Um, so the developer has to basically track what happens so you can render um, a meaningful error message. Well, I think for, I guess what I was trying to make clear for 500 errors. I totally think we should talk German, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> like for server errors? There is, uh, you don't really want this, so if it's a 500, then it's most likely some kind of bug. Okay. And you don't really have to communicate to the user, hey, this is exactly the bug that happened because they don't really care. It's, uh, it's not gonna work for them until, the f until you fix the bug. So for a 500 error, you just wanna tell them, hey, something went wrong on our side. Uh, and so you don't really need to figure out at this point what went wrong and show it to the user, but you as okay. a developer, you need to know, so you want the error handling that actually like, as the, as the exception gets raised, you catch it or you kind of handle it and log it to your logging system. So you can then get notified and say like, hey, this is where it happened, this was the error, this is the backtrace. Okay, and then you okay, can go okay, I got it. Cool, thanks. Yeah. Yeah. Do you think actually it is a good idea to tell the users try contacting us or something like this or to try again later these messages? Because I think that uh, if you say try again later, then users will just keep trying, and this bug is like, you know, over and over, and they are just frustrated, because what does it mean later? Does it mean in five minutes, or does it mean in five days? And the other one is, when you say contact us, then suddenly you've got 50 emails from users saying, hey, I, I, I saw this error, but me as a developer, I already saw it in my error mm -hmm. tracker, so the user actually doesn't have to contact me, I, I don't need it. Mm -hmm. So do you think that doesn't it make users only more frustrated because they expect the immediate response from you when they contact me? Yeah, that's a good question and I think it really depends on the kind of error because like even on the server you get different types of errors. If it's a bug, like an unexpected error, like completely unexpected, you gotta fix the bug like and they can't like they can retry all they want, it's not gonna make it go away. However, if it's for example because you temporarily couldn't reach some microservice and it, or something timed out and then you're like, okay, I know this is like a 503 or like a 504 or something. And then you know like, okay, if they try again, it's probably gonna work. Then you can uh, tell them like, oh, just retry. If it's something where you really wanna contact support, that would probably be like, if you can figure it out by the type of error being raised, is for example, if you actually have a problem with your data. You know, like if something went missing and they're just trying to, to kind of actually get a resource that's not there anymore, but it should be there, but they, it, one fix itself, it's not an actual like code error, but it's more like a data error and you probably have to have someone fix it for them, like specifically for that person or for that user. As developers, we should categorize this error by what do we expect users? Yeah. Okay. Any other questions? Yeah, the Hello. gentleman. Oh, hi, uh, thank you for your talk, it was exceptional. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, sorry. <laughs> no, I, I really enjoyed your presentation. I was wondering um, for the category of errors when we're just showing 500 pages um, where it's something that happened on the back end and we don't, mm -hmm. we don't need to inform the, the end user what happened, uh, do you think that that's the type of messaging that belongs on that page is generic enough that um, it could be a similar thing for all websites. I mean, I guess what I'm trying to get to is, is there a, could we possibly change the 500 page, the default 500 page on Rails such that it's, or the production 500 page such that it's better for end users by default? Is that something you think would be possible or does it have to be customized per, per site? I mean, you can probably, like, if you want to do it, like, 100%, you can probably customize it per site, but I think it could be a lot better as a default, just because, like, if I'm developing, like, if I'm doing it on my local machine and stuff, then, sure, like, as a developer, I know, like, this, like, something, like, serv internal server error, I know what that means. Like, if it's displayed to a user in production, I think that's actually a very good idea to say something that makes sense as, like, out of the box to a person who doesn't know what this is about. Thank you. I have one more comment. I think that uh, if you have a website, you have an application that processes users' money, if users use credit cards or something to pay you, and there is an error on the payment step, you shouldn't tell, contact us, you should tell, we will contact you. Like, I think that it's just a not developers, but the company's good practice to be proactive, because users will panic 
if right. they see an error when they provided you their credit card right. number. It's just a. I think so, and especially like if you actually manage to catch it, some kind of error that's not like a kind of no method error or something, and you know that their payment wasn't processed or it never even reached, for example, the payment uh, the credit card provider, tell them, especially about credit card payments, because that's like something that people like don't think is funny at all. Like you try to buy something and you're like, oh, did it process? Like if I order again, like will they charge me twice or like what happened? So, and otherwise, if you can't tell you got to make it so that on the back end you're actually informed, oh, like this was a, a process that involved payment, an error happened, please check on this user. Was there a payment? Did it go through or not? Uh, how, how useful do you think HTTP status codes are to users? I guess... Uh, Which kind of users? So, so actual app users. So I, I guess you still see quite a lot of 404 pages mm -hmm. with the the numbers 404 in them. I'm just wondering, is it is it so common nowadays that people know a 404 means a page cannot be found, or is it mm. still like our developer bias mm. coming in? So I guess the thing with the 404 is that's kind of the one status code that's kind of ambiguous, because it could be like this page doesn't exist, like this path per se, or like this actual resource that I was trying to find doesn't exist. So that's one of the bit more like difficult ones. But basically it says like something wasn't found. I don't think the number means anything to people. It just kind of shows up. But what a lot of websites do is like, oops, we couldn't find what you were looking for because of something. And then you still kind of, I think it's better to actually say like, hey, what should you do if you can do something? But like the number per se, I don't think it means anything. Unless you target, like your target audience is actually developers. Like if you're GitHub, like people who use your service are developers, so they're going to know what is 404. But if it's something completely unrelated, it's, I think the number it probably doesn't mean anything to actual end users. Cool. I think we have time for one last question, if there is any. Uh, do we have anyone else with questions? No? Okay, thank you very much, Laura. Thank you.